fielder. He's gone to the dog. Welcome to the Gone to the Dogs podcast. Man, do we have an exciting show for you today. I've been trying to lasso this guy for a long time to get him on here. Uh, We uh, usually get to visit uh, the first weekend after New Year's every year at the Grand American. This year we didn't get to do that because of extenuating circumstances. In fact, we kind of had a plan to get together at the Grand American and record but uh, we're doing it via telephone, if Ma Bell will hang in there with us today. But, man, I am excited uh, to introduce uh, the listening audience to a fellow that I know a lot of you already know. And if you don't know him, you've heard of him because he's been deeply involved in coon hunting, especially with tree and walker dogs, and has uh, played an important role in a lot of the uh, really good dogs that uh, we recognize down through history. But, man, it's just great to have my good friend, Mr. Jimmy Wildman Meeks. How you doing, Jim? Oh, pretty good, buddy. Glad to hear you talking there a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well, I tell you what, that's about all I could do. They say I've got a real face for radio. But, there you uh, go. <laughs> But, boy, this talking has been a chore here this year. It's been right before my White River trip. I came out, I had a, some kind of upper respiratory deal and had to take antibiotics. And and then uh, uh, I got through that okay, had a great hunt out there for about six, seven nights. And then uh, here, but as the Grand American uh, came up the road, uh, I was great. Thursday drove all day up to Orangeburg's about seven, seven and a half hours, but uh, and was able to go with Terry Walker out to the Chamber of Commerce uh, banquet, and it was also the Purina Award presentation for their outstanding coonhound and and bench show dogs, and had a great time there. But began to feel a little little off off center, and uh, got back to the room and just kind of chilling a little bit and all that. So Friday turned out to be a rocky road. I kind of left uh, Terry hanging there part of the day because uh, I just have to go out to the truck and and take a little nap and and try to (laughs) build my strength. Hey, you guess it has anything to do with my age, Jim? I don't think so. (laughs) I think that's just an old folks saying. Well, I know you're just a nudge or two on the scale higher than me. I'm 75. How old are you? 78. 78. Well, you're carrying that very well, my friend. We're very, not far well. apart. Not very far. Well, listen, I want our audience to know who Jimmy Meeks is. And um, I know that you wrote a column for many years for Full Cry Magazine, didn't you? Oh, yeah. I started yeah. writing that back in the 70s. Yeah, man. And uh, was that back when Seth Galt was the editor? Uh, no, uh, Estelle Walker had one first oh, started. Oh, okay. And yeah. Seth. And, uh, and I've been all the way down through the years. I see. <laughs> well, you know, that's a name that Mrs. Walker, what a sweet lady she was, wasn't she? Yes, I, I thought the world of her. And yeah. she'd take the time to talk to you if you called her to. Oh, absolutely. And I remember my dad on a, two or three occasions down through the years had uh, sent a little article in, you know, and mm-hmm. man, she'd send a letter back of appreciation. It sounded like a letter from home, uh, yeah. you know, something from a, a, a favorite aunt or something. She'd she'd tell you about the crops and uh, or the garden and uh, and uh Everything just such a personable, sweet lady, and she uh, acted like she acted like you was doing her a favor by sending a column in instead of her doing you one. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, times have changed, haven't they, in the way people look at things like that? Oh uh, yeah. And I can't say enough about Terry Walker. I do write for him in American Cooner Magazine, and he has been an awesome guy to work with, and he's a good, good dear friend of mine, and. And uh, it's always good to see him, and I did see him at at the Grand American. But, uh, yeah, just for those that like the history of our sport, you can't uh, uh, 
mention, you know, a ma- the magazines uh, without mentioning uh, Mrs. Walker there in Sedalia, Missouri. And I was fortunate to go out there one time, and uh, and uh, we had, I think it was Red Bone Days there. But at any rate, I didn't mean to chase that rabbit down that path, but, <laughs> but we, we got that tree shine. Now we need to move on a little bit. Hey, I want you to tell our listeners who Jimmy Meeks is, how, where, he, where he comes from. Uh, how he got involved in this craziness that we call coon hunting. Well, I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina, 78 years ago. And uh, I was a city boy, but I was always hunting or fishing or wallowing in the creek or something or other. And uh, this old guy that possum hunted, he worked at a trucking company where my daddy worked. Uh, he worked in the tire shop. And he had a son my age, and he had a son my brother's age. And uh, sometimes they'd come over, and we'd play ball and all, and they was talking about hunting. hunting. That's all they talked about. So I finally talked my daddy and letting me go. And the first night we went, uh, we didn't tree no possums. They run a fox most of the night, and froze to death. And the next time we went, we caught a possum, and I was just thrilled to death. I I thought he was dead. I wanted him to give him to me, and he told me just leave him in that bag. And after a while, he opened that sack up, and he's sitting there grinning. I, <laughs> I seen what he meant then. But we didn't have deer back then. We just we possum hunted, rabbit hunted the same dog, and they had they had tree a squirrel when we rabbit hunting sometime in the daytime. And I just got to doing that, and I just fell in love with tree dogs, and uh, I well hunting anything actually, uh, and. Over a period of time, we got to getting a coon or two around Charlotte, and most of the way we got them, we bought them through the wildlife department. We'd buy them from the trappers down at the ocean and uh, turn them loose, and the wildlife department would pay us half of what we paid for them. Hmm. And uh, we got to we got to getting dogs that tree a coon, and but they still tree possum. We'd run a we'd run a coon on the river down there where the Charlotte Motor Speedway is now, they'd run a coon in there for 20 or 30 minutes and make a loss and sit down and tree. You'd go in there and they'd have a little old five-pound possum. <laughs> well, they weren't doing wrong because we shot possums out to them. Yeah. And yeah. When, we, when we finally got enough coons that we could tree coons regular, we just quit shooting the possums out. And uh, that's how we got into coon hunting. And uh, I hunted with a a lot of guys back then that had some real dogs. Uh, back then, people walk hunted their dogs. You you walk a big circle. You hunted away from the truck and hunted around back to the truck. And uh, you couldn't. You probably couldn't have gave one of these wide wide hunting dogs that they got now. You couldn't have given them away. Uh, right. We we had plenty of places to hunt. We just didn't have a way to get around and no way to find a dog. Right. And, uh, so I, I got in with, I got in with A.J. Wright down in, uh, Marshall, North Carolina, and he was hunting gray dogs. He had an old black dog called Oakley, and I know you remember Jimmy Carpenter. Oh, sure. I, I sure well, Jimmy Carpenter, Jimmy Carpenter hunted with him a many a night. If he was still living, he could tell you. He called that little dog Ugly, and, and he was a powerhouse. And everybody bred to him, but I don't think he ever threw the tree dog. <laughs> and uh, at one time, uh, he bet Red Dole on a thousand dollars that Ugly could beat Bali, uh, Merchant's Bali, and and he would hunt on Red's land uh, and let him furnish the judge. But of course, Red wouldn't do it, and he probably he couldn't win because this little dog would have beat him. You know that would been the greatest thing in the world. And if yeah. he had beat the little dog, well, he's supposed to. He's the world champion. <laughs> right, right. But that was like some of these one-on-one things they're blowing up nowadays. You know, I got the greatest and all this. <laughs> but the little ugly dog, he he was a super nice dog. Well, A.J. Wright got a pup off of Touch Tilly and Houses Bali, and he called her Wright Sue. And the stock of dogs I got goes back to that. And, right. uh several times and of course giving credit where it's due uh the uh my old, my dogs went back to sailor jr and a female out of 
a Finley River Chief. Mm-hmm. Well, she was out of Finley River Chief and a banjo female. And then uh, they bred her to that Sailor Junior dog. Well, the old blaze dog you hunted with. Yeah, yeah, many nights. Yeah, right. he was out of Sailor Junior and Wright Sioux. Right. And that's where my old Tom dog come from. And so then, that was your first first of your dogs that you my first registered tree and walker. Yeah, I got you. Now you your kennel name has been what down through the years? Yak and River. Right. I wanted you to say that because yeah. I know that everybody in the Coonhound world has heard that that uh, description or that name Yak and yeah. River. And I just wanted to establish where that came from. Of course, the Yadkin River is there in North Carolina, not far from where you live now, right? Well, I just live a few, very few miles from it. But mm-hmm. uh, when I when I got that, when I started off, a guy that lived down there next to Abelmore, he he had his dog named Yadkin River, but he didn't advertise any dogs. He owned Old Jane, which was Tom's mama. And he didn't advertise dogs. And I bought Tom. He was a year old. And he was named Yakin River Tom. So I just kept his name that. I see. That guy lived right there at the Yakin River. And I just left that on his name. And like I say, the, the guy with Jane, he didn't advertise her. He didn't care nothing about that stuff. He had coon dogs. He just didn't advertise them. Mm-hmm. So when I started advertising Tom, I just I just left his name Yakin River. And that's how I came up with it. I see. And you carried it on from there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I want to talk about these dogs, and I want to go all down through this lineage of these dogs. But before I forget, you know, I I used to read your columns religiously in the magazines and uh, your articles and all. And I had this vision of you hunting in some of the worst swamps that exist (laughs) in the country. You did hunt. The, the low con- low country and in, in the swamps, didn't you? Yeah, I moved down below Lumberton uh, in uh, 1979. I've been hunting down there since 1960. I already knew a lot of people. So I transferred down there on my job, and I worked six months, and the place went out of business. So I just stayed down there. And there's many, many people come down there hunting with me. And I, I think if you would ask, Probably 95% of them, they never heard another dog in the woods we hunted in. Uh, just the places I hunted, there were plenty of coons and nobody hunted them. So that's where I hunted. And uh, it was pretty rough, but, you know, you hunt what you got to hunt. It ain't no rougher than these mountains here. <laughs> <laughs> well, my only experience, well, I don't guess my only experience, because later on I moved to Raleigh and yeah, uh, and all, but. I did hunt out of Lumberton one year when plot days was held there. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm not sure, but I think we might've hunted somewhere around Whiteville. Yeah. But <laughs> I had a little old dog there, you know, that, uh, had been hunted in West Virginia, a little female. And she really surprised me how she did, how well she did in that swimming water because she had never seen that much water. I mean, when the dogs were treed, they were swimming, you know, and uh, it was a unique experience for me because I had not not hunted in that kind of uh, conditions before, but seemed to be plenty of coons. Well, when I, lived, when I moved down there, like I said, I moved down there uh, Friday before Easter, 79, and there wasn't anybody that I personally knew that hunted much in the summertime. So there's, there's more snakes than there are coons. <laughs> but uh yeah. I, I hunted that and it was you know it's funny there i've seen people come down first time i went down there with tom and the first time i took jeff down there they acted like they was born in the swamp but mm. i've seen dogs that was raised down there that never really got good at it yeah yeah and uh i think it's harder for a dog it's probably just as hard for a dog to swamp to come up in these mountains when it's dry and tree coon as it is for a dog from up here to go down there and tree one it's just completely different. Yeah, I type think of ground, you know. Yeah, what they're used to. I, I'll rewind just a minute. You mentioned the snakes. Uh, one thing I do remember about that plot days is one night there on the cast. It might have been the first night we hunted. Uh, 
at some point during the cast, uh, we heard a dog yelp, you know, and the guy said, oh, that, that, that one's snake bit. He said, and I said, no, 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 don't say that, you know. <laughs> I don't want to do it. Well, of course, we had copperheads, and yeah. in some areas in the mountains, we had rattlesnakes too, but we, it really wasn't a big problem for us. But those cotton mouths can be a little bit different. Yeah, they're they're really aggressive. Yeah, and uh, and there's plenty of them down there. I live I live b- between Lumberton and Whiteville, a little place called Cerro Gordo, and I lived right off the Lumber River, and I hunted all them Lumber River swamps, Little PD River, and Lumber River, and Waccamaw River. Uh, I liked hunting the river swamps. I just I just I just enjoyed that kind of hunting, and they were plenty of coon. Well, that that's the deal, and uh, uh, you know, having plenty of coon will kind of uh, gloss over a lot of <laughs> other bad stuff. D- the problem we got down here in Florida is we got plenty of snakes for sure, mm-hmm. uh, but it's so darn thick down here. You know, just really hard to get through. You know, and if if you're even if you're on dry land, you know, yeah. palmetto thickets and bamboo briars and all this crazy stuff but uh, well anyway so you hunted down there in in the south were you when you uh got your first uh was tom your first dog now you said he was my first walker dog. first yeah. walker dog right uh when i hunted i hunted with tom's mama and his daddy in fact i was supposed to got the first chance at old blaze and then leo called me and told me he had him but uh, I hunted with Tuts Tilly, and I hunted with her litter mates, and uh, I hunted with all them dogs before I even knew about Sue. Uh, I hunted, I judged Tut Lore several times hunting dogs off of Tilly in Bali, and uh, so I knew that line of dogs all the way back. Right, right. Well, uh, describe uh, Tom. What what was he like? What did he look like, and how did he act, and and that all that? He was a he was a big white dog with a big white blaze face. He just had a few spots on him. Probably sixty five pound dog. Uh, I'd say the fastest dog I ever hunted with. And all I've had dogs I thought was better coon dog, but I never hunted with one I thought was faster. And he was a medium nose dog. He's a medium hunting dog. And he just treated him coon, kind of handled like a handled like a shepherd. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I was hunting around Charlotte and small places, you know. And when they were building Interstate 85 from Charlotte up toward Concord and Canapolis and all, we'd ride along there. They hadn't paved it yet. We'd ride along there and just send him up one side of the creek and come back. We'd send him cross the road up the other side. And he'd hunt 10 or 15 minutes, make a big circle, and come on back if he didn't strike nothing. Mm-hmm. But he was a, at that time, he was just an ideal dog, especially for them conditions. And when I took him down to the swamps down below Lumberton, he just acted like he'd been there all his life. It didn't, didn't make no difference when he smelled a coon. He could, he could handle that water good. Uh, he was a, he was one of them things you probably say was a dog of a lifetime. Well, I think we all can look at a dog, you know, back there somewhere that is our all-time favorite. As you were talking there, Jim, I was thinking about this, you know. Uh, We kind of like, you know, to really enjoy coon hunting. And I know you've competition hunted, but you've been more of a pleasure hunter down through the years. Isn't that right? Yeah. I hadn't hunted in a night hunt since 1982. I got you. Well, you know, we train our dogs and we hunt a kind of a dog that suits our territory and our style of hunting. You know, when I grew up in the mountains of West Virginia, we did a lot of road hunting. Uh, You know, we could cover a lot of territory through old uh, Civilian Conservation Club uh, uh, core uh, road ways old dirt roads rough old roads up and down mountains and things and you couldn't make much speed at it but you could cover a whole lot of ground where coon were not uh plentiful you know and uh, sometimes you rode a dog about all night before you hit a coon track but it 
but that was the kind of hunting that we had, you know, and we enjoyed a dog that, you know, they rode down the road. They didn't take off 100 miles an hour and try to get in the next county on us. You know, they stayed out there fairly uh, within the lights of the vehicle where you could kind of watch what they were doing. If you came to a fork in the road, you could kind of hit the horn and they, you know, uh, turn right or left or whatever they were used to do. And they knew what you were, you, which way they wanted you to, or you wanted them to go. But I, I guess my point I'm trying to make here and I'm stuttering around is that these dogs today that everybody seems to want that hunt out of the country, hunting the next zip code and all that will not work for every hunter in every type of territory. And, uh, it might work in the big, farms in the upper midwest and so forth uh but man it sure it sure would put a cramp on uh, my hunting style back in those days and you you mentioned i think before that you know we didn't have any tracking collars or any way to find a dog really we just had to uh, your tracking collar would get to the top of the highest hill (laughs) (laughs) that was it that was it buddy well when i lived when I lived in the swamp country, we had, we had, uh, before I moved up here, I belonged to one club. It was 9,200 acres of river bottom. Mm. And, uh, I belonged to two or three different clubs. Plus I had private land. When I lived down around Orem, I had a lot of private and the dogs I had then, uh, they didn't come back much and they were wide hunters. I mean, they hunted wide, but it wasn't that they were such a wide hunter. They hunted it. They didn't just leave and go two miles. They hunted it out good, but they they had plenty of coon. They didn't have to go wide. I hear, I hear these guys talking about see them on the internet and all the time. Yeah, we turn loose and they treat a coon at one point eight miles in two minutes. I say, ain't no dog run no mile in two minutes hunting. And the other thing, if he keeps trailing at one point two miles, why don't you go over there and turn the dog loose where all the coons is? <laughs> <laughs> I want him to hunt over here where I'm at. I'll carry him over there after a while. That's right. That's for sure. And we beat that horse to death with on these podcasts, I think, you know, yeah. different ones and stuff. But no, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, and I just don't see them being able to survive as hunting lands become more hard, to, uh, you know, more difficult to find for sure. You know, back home, we'd turn the dog, we called it turn him up the hollow, you know, and yeah. he might hunt that hollow all the way out to the head you know, all the way, and, and where it climbed the mountain and it make him a circle and come back, you know. That was the ideal kind of hunting dog where we lived, you know. Did, did you ever notice when he was coming back to the, well, we hunted out of a car when we finally got something to ride in, we just throwed him in a trunk of the car. Mm-hmm. But did you ever notice when you're heading back to the car, they never struck going back toward the car? They always struck going away from the car. Yeah. I don't know why that was. <laughs> Yeah, but uh no true. i think anybody i think anybody if they got the kind of hunting they need a dog that hunts that way i went up and hunted up in ohio and up in there a little bit back in the 70s and uh a lot of that up there big open places with uh small patches of woods right now east eastern ohio is plenty of timber you know mm-hmm. but i noticed you take dogs out of this big woods down here you turn them loose in the woods they hunt the woods you turn them loose up there, and it's a quarter mile across this field to the first hedgerow. Well, them dogs up there that's raised in it, they just go like across a bullet. Yeah. Well, these dogs up here, now they might follow that dog across there, but if you don't turn them loose mm-hmm. with that dog, well, they'll run out there two or 300 yards and come back. They expect, them, you know, they ain't mm-hmm. no woods. They expect mm-hmm. you to come home or something. Yeah. Yeah, put it me in the woods. Difference. Yeah, it does. What they're uh, accustomed to, you know. I I mentioned in my podcast uh, last week uh, when I was talking about the plot dogs that my dad and I had down through the years, a little dog called Pee Wee. And he just, you know, I, I don't know, he just got used to it hunting up there in Michigan. I'm You could stop along the road and the woods would be a quarter mile back there or, or more. And if you, when you unsnapped him, he was off like a rocket and he would be struck in that woods before yeah. you could believe it, he'd be back in there. <laughs> and then when you'd go to the tree and pull him off the tree, he'd stand there and pee for, seemed like 15 <laughs> minutes because he wouldn't stop. 
He didn't uh, have time. He didn't have time. He, he had to get to that woods. He, he cracked me up, and I don't know where he learned that, but he just, I guess he just kept looking. I, I guess if you turned him loose in the desert, he'd still be going looking for that woods. Well, that's great. Well, let's go back on these uh, Yadkin River dogs because there's some pretty uh, – Famous dogs there, and there's also a connection to some more. Um, so we got Tom, and what'd you what'd you do with him? Okay, well I, I bred Tom to a female out of banjo too. This is giving credit where it goes. John Monroe and, and Joe House and all them, you know, they had a lot to do with it. Probably everything is around now. But I bred him to a female out of banjo too, and that's where Jeff's mother come from. I got her as a stud fee pup and let Kyle Chase have her. Well, she made a real dog when he got ready to breed her. AJ had bred Sue to Sailor Jr. again, and he had a dog called Pistol Pete. It was a full brother to Blaze, just a different litter. And uh, he, I, I took him down there and bred her, in fact, and that's where Jeff come from. And uh, that that's was a Yadkin, real good Yadkin, Yadkin River, River Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And Kyle, Kyle raised him up and trained him and i got him from him he was close to two year old i sold him tom and i got jeff and uh i had jeff probably a year or more before i moved down to the swamp country but jeff was out of pistol feet like i said pistol feet was a full brother to blaze just a different litter now let me interrupt you these dogs had a lot of sailor boy breeding in them right Oh, yeah, yeah and they looked it in their heads at least oh, the blaze mm -hmm. dog did yeah you know? Did the Pete well, dog I, also? I don't recall seeing Pete. Well, I'll tell you how this stuff went. AJ, he was a building contractor. Okay. When he got ready to breed Sue, he went on a trip and he hunted with Johnson's Banjo, Banjo 2, Deep River Mike, Katie's Rowdy, uh, Sailor Jr., Sailor Son. And he said Banjo 2 was the most impressive dog that he ever went with. He said he was just awesome. Mm -hmm. But he said all around, what suited him best was the Sailor dog. So he bred the Sailor Junior, and that was the first litter. That was Blaze's litter. And them was great big old, well, you know how Blaze was. Right. Them great big old, looked like quarter horses. Mm -hmm. And uh, and them was good looking dogs. Oh, yeah. Well, he, he bred the Sailor Son the next time. And them dogs was just as good, but they had calico ears, half white faces, and he didn't like that. He liked a pretty dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but they were just as good a dog. So the next time he bred her, he went to Sailor Junior again. That's where Pistol Pete come. I see. And then we bred Pistol Pete to a daughter of Tom, which was off of Pete's brother. And that's where Jeff come from. I got you. Well, just to interject there, we mentioned that I knew this uh, Brax Blaze dog. And uh, a good friend of mine, Leo Lars, there in, in, in near my hometown, he worked on the railroad uh, and uh, always kept a good coon dog and was serious about his coon hunting. Uh, yeah. Quite a character, really. Good. Did you know Leo? Uh, yeah, he uh, he called me when I advertised Tom at Stud and told me that he had Blaze. Mm, and okay. and I actually lived right I lived right out of Charlotte. Then he actually came down, and we mm -hmm. went hunting that weekend. We hunted Blaze and Old Tom together. Had a real hunt. Nice gentleman, big uh, old rascal. Yeah, too. big fella. You and, wouldn't believe he'd get up and down in mountains like I he know would. it. I know <laughs> it. And he was a joker too, boy. Yeah, I mean, he loved a, a good laugh and always had a bunch of stories. I've told some of his stories on on this podcast, but uh, yeah, there again, you know, uh, a dear friend that I enjoyed hunting with so much has gone on, and. Uh, but yeah, I, I was fortunate, and he used to tell a story about a uh, old Blaze. Uh, Blaze was a sit down tree dog, yeah. and when he when he'd tree, he'd bounce those front feet. And there was a fellow named Elwood Ferguson down around uh, around Charlottesville, Virginia, that uh, El, uh, that Leo hunted with. And, Elwood uh, Ferguson. Yeah. Yeah, I knew that was good. Yeah. And he would tell Leo, he said, we got to go, old Blaze is stomping his feet. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, those are great memories right there. Okay, describe Jeff. Jeff was a, he was probably 80 pounds. He was a big old, big muscle up dog. He was good looking dog, had that wide Blaze face, just like mm -hmm. Tom. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, he had, I, 
you know, when you when you remember things, you'll say, well, this dog was better than this and better than that, but you got to have them together to really know. But he was the loudest dog that I ever had. And mm-hmm. he would literally, when they were in there deep, he would literally, you'd be going to him, and all of a sudden you start hearing little noises. Then when you get closer, well, these dogs. And then it dawned on you, there was other dogs there. Mm-hmm. But he was literally a drowned out tree dog. But uh, his biggest thing, he, he was a one bark tree dog. When he located his tree, he was accurate, but regardless, when he located it, it was over right there. And I remember A.J. Wright told a lot of people, what people miss about Jeff is they hear him tree and hear all that mouth, and they don't pay attention. But when he struck a track, he was just like following a, a white line down the middle of the highway. When he struck a track, cold or hot, he just he just take a track out of here and tree it just mm. easy. It yeah. was easy to him. And he was a super good water dog, but he was a, you know, he didn't have, but I think 300 and something puppies, but you look at all the big name dogs that ain't far off from him. You know, that dog, he produced some dogs that really reproduced, but he died when he said me old with cancer. If he lived till he's 10 or 11, he might not ever done any more, but I'd like to think he would have. You know, as you're talking about Jeff, and I hunted with several of those dogs of that breeding, you know, offspring down and and all, and and I'm just reminded, you know, my mind's eye takes me back to a foggy night, you know, uh, cutting a big old muscled up walker dog, blaze faced, big yeah. big rascal, cut him loose into the dark sitting there to listen a little bit and hear that mouth come open and, and, and that, you know, and, and drive that track through the country and come locate. Now, man, right there, uh, I could, I couldn't put a price on that. What it means to yeah. me as a coon hunter. And I think any coon hunter that that's ever experienced that will say, that's why we do what we do, just to be able to yeah. hunt dogs like that. And, you know, I, and I don't want to be critical of any man's dog, and whatever suits him is fine with me, you know, but I hear a lot of dogs today, they make a lot of racket, but they're not in, they're not uh, pleasurable to listen to, you know. I I hear a lot of dogs today, that, uh, and I'm just like you're talking about, I'm not naming any breeds or anything because they summon everything. But I hear a lot of dogs today that sound more like a pack of fox dogs mm-hmm. than they do coon dogs. When I think of a coon dog, I'm thinking, don't matter to me if he's chop or ball or whatever, but I'm thinking a big, heavy mouth dog. Mm-hmm. I when always... I hear them yippy mouth dogs, I'm thinking a fox dog. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. I know we <laughs> had a friend up in uh, well, the late Wayne Cottle from Kentucky that was so active yeah, I with him. Yeah, with Kentucky Houndsman. He would come up and hunt with a fellow named Denny Raymer up there in northern Indiana. And Denny had a dog, and I think it came down out of, it may have come down out of Lipper. Uh, uh, Wayne, I think, at one time had that Arkansas River crank dog. I believe yeah, it was a Lipper bred dog. But this dog of Denny's, when he'd come on a tree, it just sounded for the world like a pack of coyotes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and. and and we would kid him no end, you know. But, yeah, I guess, you know, whatever turns you on, but if you can have what you want, as far did as I'm ever, concerned. Go ahead. Did you ever hear Wayne locate and sit down oh, a tree? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he, told me, he told me several times he got there doing that, and people come around there and see what dog it was a tree. And <laughs> yeah. I don't doubt it. We was at the world hunt, and he sounded more like a dog than a dog did. Oh, yeah, he was good at it. And there's another yeah. fellow that's good at that, too. They call him Rambo. He's out in, around Benton, Kentucky, out there around yeah. where they held a PKC World Hunt. He'd locate and come tree like that, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, I know years ago when I'd be on the phone and probably in the office at UKC and talking, and and I'd I'd describe a hunt we had the night before, and I'd, I'd uh, give a locate and come tree. <laughs> He's on the phone, and the <laughs> girls in the office look at me like, what in the world are you doing? Uh, All right, so we got Jeff is out of Tom. Right. And you said Jeff died when he no, was. No, Jeff's mama was out of Tom. Our, oh, okay. Okay. And Jeff's Jeff, daddy and Tom's daddy were brothers. Okay, that's right. That's right. Okay, and, and 
and Jeff died at seven years old, you see. Yeah. Cancer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's so tough, man. I lost my roper dog at seven and my wrangler dog at nine that were pretty good dogs. And uh, it, it, it's a blow when they go that early, you know. Well, for sure. he, he had uh, he had a little a little knot on his back about the size of your little fingernail. And I took him to the vet, and the vet, uh, he had broke a toenail up in his toe, and I took him there to have it took off. The toenail took off, and he said, you better take this little knot off. I said, no, it's been there all his life. He said, I just brought a little cyst. I'll take it off. Well, he took it off and in a few months, it was big as a golf ball. Mm. And, uh, I took it back. I had him off. He sent it off and they give him six months. And, uh, I kept him alive almost two years before I had to put him down. And, uh, but he, I stood there and watched him. He'd fall, he'd fall each one of them little fingers out like roots on a tree. You know, trying to get mm-hmm. all that cancer out, but mm. you just never could get it all. Yeah, that's a shame. All right, so now where did we go? Well, uh, old Tar Rattler would be the next in age. There's the name. Yeah, I, I kept Rattler's mama for Alan's shoe. I kept her in hunted her for him about a year and a half, and I told him I wanted to raise me a litter of pups. And he said, Well, just go ahead and I'll sign the papers. So I bred her to. Jeff and I raised that litter of pups and Carlton Adams down in Athens, Georgia, he had come up and hunted with me. I had hunted a dog for him for two or three months and he hunted with, uh, uh, Peggy and Jeff. And he said, if you ever breed them dogs, I want to get a puppy. So I bred him. I called him and he come up. A lot of people look at Rattler. They don't know. He was the only blanket, the back dog in that litter. Them dog was from white to spotted. And mm-hmm. uh, he he come up and he said, man, I sure wish I could have got that dog. I said, are you talking about that ugly thing? He said, yeah. I said, I was afraid I wouldn't be able to sell him. So he bought three of them pups, a Rattler, a Judge, and a female. And uh, I told him to bring me Rattler, just ride them around, lead them, let, let them get used to the truck, pet them, let them know their name, don't show them nothing, don't mess with them. So he brought me Rattler back and I hunted him and got him started and he started quick and he was really impressive. He was, he was a loud, loud dog. I mean, he was an awesome tree dog and, um, but he wasn't as loud as Jeff. And, uh, he come and got Rattler and brought me Judge. Well, I hunted Judge and started him and now Rattler's, uh, mother, Peggy, she was real mouthy on the ground. Her daddy was mouthy on the ground. But his litter mates were right from up here around Statesville, and most of them were silent to almost silent. But mm-hmm. uh, the the judge dog made a real good dog, but if he barked, it was pretty good track. He'd just go in there and treat a lot of coon. And the female, Tim Kramer and Frank Priester, I believe, got her. And, and Tim told me later on she made a real good dog. But it was two of them other dogs right around me at Lumberton. And I got a hold of one of them later on, and boy, he was outstanding. And uh, there was one at Jamestown, South Carolina, and I shipped one to Iowa. But all these that was around here made good dogs. And, of course, they bred right for right good bit, and uh, I think he done a pretty good bit of reproducing some pretty decent dogs, you know. But he was a he was an impressive type dog. Uh, and, and and had that big old mouth. Yeah, for sure. Well, and how long did you own Rattler? Well, uh, you raised him as a puppy. Well, there, I, right? I sold him. I sold him as a pup, and he brought him back to me, and I kept him uh, about three or four months, and got, and got him right. And he he didn't know a coon from a pickup truck when he brought him back to me. He just all he knows how to lead and how to ride in the truck. And uh, then when he was about three years old, Carlton had cancer, and he was going through chemo and all. And uh, he brought him back to me, and I kept him the whole hunting season that year and hunted him. But uh, after he was a puppy, I never owned him myself. I kept him there and hunted him and all, but I didn't own him. And uh, like I said, I started to judge the dog for him. He made a nice dog. But uh, Well, I know that Rattler – changed hands a lot of times in his yeah. life. I, I looked at the hard record on him one time while I was at UKC mm. and I don't want to 
be the bearer of false information, but it seemed like it was about 11 or 12 times or something at that point that he had actually changed hands. Um, well, Carl had him, and he sold him to a boy. I don't remember his name. A boy and his daddy there right next to Carlton on him. Uh, he got him, and I think he put all the titles on him. And then I think Harvey French got a hold to him. And then uh, what's the boy up there in Minnesota, I believe? Waltz. Yeah. He, uh, Mike uh, Walt, what? No. Schultz. 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 Yeah. Yeah. He got a hold to him, and I don't know who owned him in between them, but I'm thinking that Delton got him from him. I'm not sure, mm, but he yeah. changed hands too many times. Uh, I don't know why, but when Delton got a hold to him, he was, he wasn't Timothy Ball, but he was a pretty good promoter and, uh, <laughs> he promoted that dog. And he, he done a right good bit of breeding on that dog. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he did. And he got to be pretty famous and the, and of course, Naylor, you know, yeah. uh, perpetuated that, um, uh, quite a bit, and uh, I no doubt that was his most famous offspring. I would I would say, yeah, uh, I agree with that. But uh, and Naylor was a big, you know, handsome Walker dog for sure. You know, I saw oh, yeah. Naylor several times. I didn't hunt with him, and I hunted with some good dogs out of Naylor. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, when you got a stud dog that's bred so much to so many different uh, females, you're bound to have pups all across the the spectrum you know oh, yeah. and, well people uh, breed good dogs to them and you get good pups and people breed sorry dogs because mm-hmm. they can sell pups yeah, yeah so it sure. ain't all his fault and he don't get all the glory either you know it's funny yeah. when the pups are good it's always the stud dogs good pups if they ain't no good they blame it on the female <laughs> and a lot of times it's the opposite way around yeah i like a good female myself well i think most knowledgeable uh, hunters will will say that, and you hear this a lot more in some of the experiences uh, that I've had with these podcasts and on listening to guys say, well, I want females, I want good females, and then I've got the choice of what stud dog I want to breed to, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and to me, that's that's pretty smart. Uh, uh I, you know, I've I've been up and down on whether I like just as far as hunting. I've never been a big breeder, <clears throat> but you know, sometimes I'd like I'd get on a stretch I wanted to hunt male dogs, you know, and yeah. then then I'd get on another stretch and I would think a female was all I wanted. But usually those females would uh, do me wrong when it came time for plot days or whatever. <laughs> They'd come in the heat and I'd be perfect timing. There. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, so out of Jeff, then what do we do? Uh, Champ come along, and Champ was off of a grandpup of Flag. They bred a they bred a female out of Flag to a, a dog they called Sundown Hank. It, Beller had the dog, and he sold it to a guy up there next to Raleigh. I can't think of his name, but VL Whitson on Mindy, and, and uh, he bred her to that Sundown Hank dog. And he got Champ's mama. Would that Jill. by chance have been Brian Perry up there? No, no, no? what okay. Brian? I can't think of his name, but uh, okay, he won a lot with that dog. All right, but anyway, I got Champ, and uh, I lived when you come to my house. Then you was coming to see me, or you were lost. Yeah, I lived at the end when you passed my house. It was swamp everywhere, and uh, I let my dogs run loose with a little old beagle. When they started tree, and I'd put them up, and start hunting them. But when Champ was just a little old puppy, Gene Tyree and Bill Miller and some of them come down there. They was beans out there about waist high. And them dogs was running a rabbit and we was waiting on dark. And they said, what's that? I said, that's my puppies. A little bit them two, seven, eight month old puppies walked in. That one kept running. They was bragging about how tough he was. A little bit, he quit. A little bit, he come out of the beans. They said, well, what's that? I said, I said that's that dog running that rabbit. They just couldn't believe it. He was just he was just ungodly. Was just, I mean, it was unreal how tough he was when he was young. We'd catch cats and possums and turn them loose. And we'd turn four or five puppies loose, and they'd be running crazy, and he'd just go right there and tree it. Didn't matter what they did, he'd sit there and tree. And when I knew he was going to be good, it was running rabbits with them dogs one day, and he fell off a rabbit race and treated a squirrel and held it while they was running that rabbit. And I, I said, well, that's that's pretty good there. And he quit running rabbits too. But he was uh, 
I tell you what, when he started off, he had a little old yippy mouth that sounded like a feist. And people said, well, why do you keep that dog and get rid of them big mouth pups? I said, because this thing trees coon. And when he was about 12 or 13 months old, his mouth changed over. And ain't nothing, nothing living could drown him out. I mean, he just had a, he was chalk mouth all the way, but he had a tremendous mouth. And probably, well, I know he's the best water dog I ever hunted with. And I'd say he's the best coon dog I ever hunted with all, all around. I don't think he was as fast as Tom, but he caught more coons every year than all the dogs I hunted with in my whole life. Everybody's and mine included. He catch more coons on the ground every year than all them dogs. He just, I mean, me and Ed Hammond lived down there next to Whiteville. We was talking about a month ago, and we was keeping a little old journal one year. And like in February, he caught over 30 coons that we went out there and found. And if he caught them very <laughs> far in there, we wouldn't even go in there because he wouldn't show them to you. If he was very far off, just not would leave him alone. But that, that one year, we caught over 30 in like a month there. That I mean, we picked up the coons, carried them to the truck. Now he was an open trailer. Yeah, uh, he he barked every breath. People say, "How do you know when he's treated?" I said, "They can probably tell him when he's treat. But now we had a uh, uh, Kent Spencer. You know Mike Gates, don't you? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Kent Spencer, Mike Gates, and uh, uh, McDonald boy that come down from Cali with Mike. I can't think of his name. Anyway, Kent Spencer brought him down, and we had six or eight more people with us. We cut Champ out by himself. It was a deep swamp. It wasn't wide, but it was deep. He went and struck, and he was just driving. He was in probably four foot of water, and uh, he was just every breath. And what he'd do when he got getting body scent, he just he quit tracking. He'd go to running body scent, and he was uh, he went to cutting back on his barking. And one of them boys said, "Well, he's cutting the radar on." And Mike said, uh, "What are you talking about?" I said, he fixed to catch that coon. He said, is that right? I said, yeah, about the time he quit barking, Mike says, what's he done now? I said, he caught that coon. He said, man, I don't want to hear that BS. I heard that. I, got, yeah. I said, pull your boots up, Jack. We went out there and he had about a 12-pound bull coon killed. Never made a sound. Uh, I'd say you wouldn't hear 5% to 10% of the coons he caught. You'd never hear him make a sound. He just killed them. I mean, just bam. <laughs> and, um, uh, but he, he thought we were just cutting up, but I mean, he just, I had him one night catch three. I had company two or three times he'd catch two. And, uh, but that was unusual. Now, most time he'd catch one or most time he didn't catch nothing, but during the rut, he catch them coons mm-hmm. and, uh, he, they'd be running straight away and he'd shut up and they would make a right turn. And he he done cut across and had the coon kill it before they ever get there. They'd run the track out and he'd be done cut a hundred yards off of him and caught the coon killed him. He just it just it wasn't that he was that fast. He just had brains. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, he uh, now what did he look like? He was snow white. He had uh, I still pick my pups looking like him. He was snow white. He had a black spot in the base of his tail. And two spots about big around as your hand, right in front of that black spot, right on his backbone. And he had a, a black spot on his side, and he had a tan head and didn't have much blaze. But he was just, he was close to snow white as you could get. And uh, after he got about 13, 14 months old, his mouth changed over. He had a great, big, loud, chopped mouth. But he was a wide, wide hunter, and uh, he was just, he just awesome. Now That's, he just figured pretty strong in your breeding program and in some other programs too, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Uh, it's funny. People say, well, you don't see no world champions and all. He must not have been bred good, but you know, I, I think champ had about 1100 puppies on the ground and the way them puppies got there is when people would come to breed the Jeff champ was a little old puppy and I'd turn him loose. Well, he just split tree and all over the swamp. So when he got old enough to breed, they would come back and breed to him. And then when they'd come to breed to him, I had Chico. He was five, six months old. He just, he just treeing coons all around and split tree. And then when he got old enough to breed, they started coming breeding to him. And 
and it was word of mouth. And most of the time, it was just people that coon hunted. Uh, I, they wasn't a whole lot of them made it in the great big world. Uh, might not have been good enough to, but they made pretty good tree dog and coon dog. Well, I'd say for sure. Now, <clears throat> all right. Well, let's let's go ahead and run out this uh, your own personal dogs, and then let's let's talk about how they uh, okay. played a role in uh, in some other famous dogs. Now, you said, <clears throat> okay, uh, Champ. How long did he live? Uh, Champ, I, I put him down Saturday before Christmas, and he'd been fifteen that April. I see. He just had arthritis; he couldn't get up and down. Yeah, 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 for sure. Now, did he sire Chico? No, he sired Chico's mama. Okay. Uh, Chico's mama and uh, Nathan Ed Zip, female. Yeah. And there's a bunch of them dogs was off of him and Shaw's Judy. Now, what a lot of people don't look at this, Shaw's Judy's granddaddy was a littermate brother to Pistol Pete and a full brother to Tom's daddy. And see, mm -hmm. she was, they were also littermates. Uh, Zip and Chico's mama were also litter mates to the merchant's tree blaster. Well, I was just going to mention that when you were talking about Zip and about her. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I hunted with Zip. She was a nice female, real yeah. tree dog. Uh, yeah. Old Chico's mama was too. Uh, Randy, uh, can't think of his last name. He lived down in Georgetown, South Carolina. He, he, uh, the other guy that had a pup off of, a mate to Yak and Tar Rattler called me. He had a buddy hunting with him that wanted a puppy. And I had gray, sir. She was about four months old and she was gray colored. And I said, well, I'd sell her. I said, he said, what you want for? I said, is the boy going to hunt her? He said, yeah. I said, well, I'll let him have her for $100. Well, he said, we'll be there tomorrow. Well, when I got up the next morning, she was treed solid down at the edge of the swamp. And here he come with $100. Well, he started not to buy her because she's gray. And he went ahead and bought her. And uh, she made a real dog, and that uh, he started wanting to breed her. I told him I'd breed her to Rattler. So he went up there to Harvey French's to breed her to Rattler. Harvey called me and said, this is some kind of fool. I said, what you talking about? He said, he wanted to breed the Rattler and said he wanted to look at him. said he went out there and had a whole handful of pictures, and he was out there holding them pictures up at every angle of Rattler to be sure he bred to the right dog. And uh, he gave me Chico. I don't know why he gave them to me. I didn't need no pup, but that was a real litter of pups. And mm -hmm. uh, Chico just, he started about as young as any dog tree and cones. He was a, just a born natural. And uh, What did he look like? He was probably 75 pound, 78 pound. He looked just like Tar Rattler. He was a big old blanket back dog, big, mm -hmm. big head, big bone dog, great big mouth. Uh, he was a nice dog. I, I always hated myself. I'd, I'd be hunting young dog, and he'd be standing out there two-year-old on the fence begging to go, and, and I'd leave him at home, and all I was doing was hunting them pups, trying to get one like him, and I had him right there. And all that time I wasted not, <laughs> yeah. all that time I wasted not hunting him, and then yeah. he died of kidney failure when he was nine years old. Mm. Yeah, doggone. Well, you mentioned Harvey French a couple times here tonight, Jimmy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Harvey was a nice guy that I remember. And the first time I actually met Harvey was at the Purina Award in uh, the spring of uh, 83, I guess it was, when he had won the UKC World Hunt with the Rock River Banjo Dog. He yeah. and uh, Dave Blankenship. And, uh, uh, Harvey, is he still involved in coon hunting? Do you hear anything I, from him? I don't know, really. Last I heard from him, he had Tar Rattler there, and he had, um, uh, I forgot what the female was, but when them dogs left, I ain't heard from him since, and that's mm -hmm. that's been years ago. Right, right. Well, okay, so how did the... The Adkin River dogs figure in the background of the Rock River Sackett Jr. dog. Well, uh, David Gilroy, him and his uncle Gordon, uh, they come down and bred David's female. She was a uh, tree picking Bill and uh, 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 I can't even think of the other dog's name. Anyway, they come and bred her, and uh, Sackett was uh, off of that cross. And, uh, 
That was the old Sackett dog, right? Yeah. yeah. He was off. He was, no, I, I told you wrong. Crowder was off of that cross. Yeah. Crowder and Southern Sound Jake. Well, they bred Crowder to a champ out of female, a female out of champ. And that's where the old Sackett dog come from. Right. And that was Sackett Jr.'s daddy. Yeah, I had the privilege of hunting uh, a night or maybe two with Frank and old Sackett and uh, saw for sure that he was a coon trier. And uh, yeah. yeah, it was kind of a, a, a interesting hunt. We, Alan Snedeker and Frank and I turned three dogs loose. We got, They got a three-way split <clears throat> right off the snap. And uh, those guys each had a coon and I had a den, a little plot females hunting and then so then Alan's dog got deep through the country. I said, Alan, I'll go get him. And Frank said, well, while you guys are doing that, I'm going to hunt through this section. And, of course, when we went around and picked him up, he had three coons in his coat. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always well, I, it's always fun when you go hunting with Frank. Yeah. That's for sure. Before I get, before I get through this, I want to give a, another more credit. James Shaw lives at uh, Evergreen, North Carolina. And he had the Shaw's Judy dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, he hunted. He hunted Peggy when I kept her for Alan. He, he hunted her all the time, and he bred her to Jeff. And uh, uh, that's where Tree Talking Crockett, the, the the daddy to the Cracker dog, Silver Dollar Cracker. Tree Talking Crockett was off of uh, his mama was off of Jeff and Judy. Well, Judy was Zip and Blaster and all them's mama too, and. Uh, he he bred that dog several times, and he was just a kid then, and that, he reproduced some good dogs off of that female. Well, I just listened to a podcast from my friend Tyler Duncan there is Coon Hunting University, and he had uh, Winston Aaron on on the program, and that dog came up, you know, uh, the name came up several times in that conversation, but. Uh, well, Jim, that's the thing that I've always noticed about you. That you're always very, very quick to give credit to other people. Uh, and I, I know your contribution to the Walker breed has been profound, really. I mean, there's been a lot of good dogs. Uh, and, of course, when you talk about Rock River Sackett, of course, how many times Sackett Jr. Uh, impacted somebody's uh, coon hunting operation. and. Uh, and you find those Yadkin River dogs back there. That's that's pretty impressive, brother. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, old Frank, he he hunted that dog. I hunted with I hunted with him right after he got Sackett Junior. Uh, I don't believe he was two year old yet, and he he was just an awesome dog. We we turned him loose, and I'll never forget he had a bunch of people up there one night, and hired Winchables with us. Hmm. And we had hired two dogs and Sackett Jr. And we turned loose down there at the, uh, the hatchery, trout pond or whatever mm-hmm. they call it. And them dogs treed right together and hired two dogs left running wide open. And we were just sitting around and them boys said, well, that other dog will leave. And Frank just laid back and put his head back on his hat. And he said, when y'all decide he's going to stay, you tell me and we'll go over there. Well, hired two dogs, treed that coon. We went over and killed that coon, and then went to sack of Junior. He's sitting there with the coon where he was at, and I mean, they left. They they might they might have been twenty foot from the tree, but they was right there, and they left running, screaming, red hot. He just sat right there. Yeah, and, yeah. But see, when he 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 was a daddy rat attack. Oh yeah. He, you can just imagine what all rat attacks were. Yeah. The country. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, Frank well, hunted, Frank hunts them dogs, and and when when he tells you want to do it, you don't have to listen to him and believe his word. He'll take you hunting. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> I was, uh, I took advantage of his friendship, and he took my cruise pup up there, uh, not this past summer, but the summer before, you know, and uh, yeah, and and kept him up there for about three months or so, and uh, hunted the hair off of him. Oh yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and Frank uh, and Randy Smith and I went up and picked him up and had a good. We got to hunt a couple nights with Frank and and Rob and Alan Snedeker and and Kiefer, uh, Jerry, uh, Larry Kiefer and, and yeah. Uh, uh, 
Brandon, Frank's partner on old, uh, old Mac, uh, Max, I think. Anyway, I get all the names confused and uh, D- <laughs> DJ McCombs, all those boys. We had a great time up there. Right. And uh, man, this coon hunting fraternity is just uh, such a joy uh, to me, especially now. I just wish that I could uh, go uh, put more years on my card, you know, take my yeah. coon hunting card and say, here. Here, here, put me, put me about 10 or 15 more years on there, would you? Uh, because I'm still old enough. I mean, I'm still young enough to enjoy it and get out and still do it, but not like I used to, but I'll never, never get tired of it. That's for sure. Well, where do we go from Chico and all? What's going on, uh, on down the road? Well, I'll tell you what, I raised several dogs that never got any big yahoos. I raised one there I called Blaze. Uh, we had a lot of coons that year. He was off of Chico and my Shirley dog. I never mentioned the female. Shirley was probably in the top three dogs I've ever owned in my life. And she was off a of champ. And I bred her to Chico. And I'd say that was the best litter of pups I personally ever raised. And uh, But the Blaze dog, I took him. I went. To, I drove from my house to Maryland. And got with Gordon Gilroy. And then we drove all the way across to Franks. You know how far that is. Oh, I carried yeah. Blaze up. I carried Blaze up there. He was six months and three weeks old. The first night I turned loose, uh, uh, me and Robbie, and I believe Jim McConnell, we turned loose. We hunted Sackett Junior and Blaze and Jim's Charlie dog, which he was off of Chico also. We turned loose and Sackett Junior treed and Blaze treed maybe a couple hundred feet behind him. And Charlie was kind of going between them. So Jim caught him and tied him. He said, he's not going to let him go to either dog. But, uh, we went and killed Sackett Jr.'s coon, went to Blade and shot a coon to him. And, but he treed coons every night after all that riding. He treed coons every night, split treed by himself. And he'd never been over a hundred miles from home. And, uh, but that's, that's just tell you how a puppy is. And, uh, six months and three weeks old and the one i carried a pair before that he was off of a female that was off of off of rings rock river rings sister i believe and houses tom tom and uh i carried that pup pair tonight he was seven months old and uh he split treed oh i don't know first night he split treed maybe 100 feet from the other dog and he was over there shooting he's just sitting right there tree i called him rock he was a nice dog. I sold him, but the blaze dog, he was, uh, he was a real dog and I, uh, but you can't keep them all. all. Right. And, uh, but I always carried pups, but I had people ask me, said, you, you scared to carry your coon dog to get outdone? I said, no, I don't care if they're outdone or not. I can go up there and tree more coon in four nights and I can at home in the hunting season. Why would I carry a finished dog up there? I'm carrying something up there <laughs> exactly. I can do something good with, you know? Sure. Absolutely. Take advantage of that coon zoo. <laughs> but now, the first time I went up there, Frank had the rank dog. I don't guess you ever hunted with him. I did not. He, no. he was off the Rock River ring dog, but he mm-hmm. wasn't a real houndy dog. But now that was about as good a dog as a man hunts with. I told him, I said, you just put me out somewhere with this dog, and I, I'll bring you some coons to the road. <laughs> that, that, that was a real dog. Now, I, yeah. he sold him. And when he got sack at Junior, he sold rank. But uh, that was another good dog he had. It was off of them old stock he had. It was kind of funny to me when I Frank had Cruz up there, you know, and I'd talk to him every once in a while. I didn't bug him. I'd just let him, you know, we, we'd talk about once a month. And he said, well, I'm not turning this dog loose around these cornfields and these easy coons. I'm putting him in that river swamp, <laughs> you know. And he said one yeah. night there, he said, man, the guy told me, he said, if I got back in there and need help to call him, he'd had, had a boat. That he'd come back in there and help me. And he said, they got way back in there. And he said, I think they were treated for about five hours. <laughs> oh. He said, I couldn't get old to the guy. <laughs> and, but that's Mr. Coon Hunter right there. I tell you that. Well, fella he's is. got, he's got some beautiful hunting and plenty of mm-hmm. coons. And that river bottom to me is like heaven. Yeah. I mean, that's, I'd love to have a place like that. Yeah. But now he's got some little old swamps up above him up there near Bill Hawley and all. 
them swamps ain't wide, but now you'll bog up your bottom in that black mud in a minute. Oh, yeah, that's old. Lindell Price will tell you a story about him getting in one of the messes <laughs> <laughs> up there hunting with me. Yeah. You yeah. don't just go walking out across all the Michigan yeah. swamps, man. You'll be up to your chin. <laughs> you'll bloop in a minute. That's right. That's right. Ah, oh, great times with great people, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, Let's mention your good friend up in Maryland that passed away. Gordon, uh, Gordon Gilroy. Yeah. Okay. What you What you want to know about him? Just Just remember him and and just he. Yeah. Gordon Gordon called me when I I hadn't moved down there down east long. It probably nineteen eighty, and he called me and he read a couple columns and all, and he had some grade dog, and he had a plot dog I believe, and his buddy had a blue tick. And he called me, just want to know if there's any way he could go hunt with me. I told him, yeah, come on down. I, I'll take a minute here to say that anybody that ever come to breed or get a puppy, I always told them to bring his stuff and go hunting. And if you like what you see, you'll think a whole lot more of what you get. And uh, But he come down and hunted with me two or three nights, and he has had a ball. And then uh, he come down, I don't know, two or three times. And then when David got that female, they brought her down and bred her. And Gordon been coming down since I'm going to say 80 or 81. Well, David started coming down. I think David's 54. David started coming down when he was 14 years old. And they would come down two or three times. They'd come down every year during the roasting deer season. But they'd come down the week before the Grand American. We usually come down Tuesday. And we'd hunt Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night and go to Orangeburg Friday and come home Saturday night and coon hunt, and they'd go home Sunday. And uh, we did that for years and years, but they've always been as good of people as you ever met. I think David's more like a son than I do a friend. And, yeah. and Gordon was more like a brother. That really, that kind of really messed with me when he got killed. Yeah, yeah. That was a tragic thing for sure. Yeah. Now, David still comes now. He, uh, he still comes down and goes with me once in a while and comes down and visits. Uh, and and he brought his boy, Tom. I think Tom's 20 now, 19 or 20. And he started bringing Tom when he was about nine years old. <laughs> and he he's as tough, as tough as ever tough anybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, what have you done lately? Are you still breeding any dogs, Jim? No. Uh, when I moved up here... I had an old dog. I called him Kurt, and he was a real dog. And he had I. I was trying to hunt him down there, and it like ninety degrees and ninety percent humidity. And I was going to take him off trick quick. When you know how that goes. And uh, the oh, only yeah. thing that saved him was there was a little old water hole. The swamps were dried up. There was a little old water hole, and I took him in there and just kept pouring water over him. Well, uh, it messed him up, and he finally come back around a little bit. And then he just had a heat stroke out in the yard. And I carried him to the vet, and he said, well, you don't really know what it's going to do to them until they get over it. And he said, but they, they, can't, they can't control the heat that wants to ever have a heat stroke. It's easier to have it again. He ended mm-hmm. up having three heat strokes. And uh, when I moved up here, he was like eight or nine years old. And you might go tonight, and he might go out there and look pretty good. Tomorrow night, he'd just stand there like he didn't even know where he was at. And uh, uh, I let David take him up there. I thought he could help him a little bit with a couple of young dogs he had, but he, I think he was over the hill. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got, I had his sister. She was a real dog too. And uh, she, uh, I had her spayed and the, and the vet messed her up. He just cut her all up inside. I took her to another vet and he said she's just full of infection. So she died when she was seven. <laughs> but, uh, I moved up here and I had a few places to hunt. My wife's cousin, Kurt Sparks, I know you probably know Kurt. Mm-hmm. He, uh, I was, I've been hunting with his daddy since back in the sixties. And when I moved up here, I was hunting with Kurt and, uh, he, he always keeps good dogs. And I, I had a little dog here and there. I got a dog now it's about 10 and a half years old. I've had him since before he was two and he trees coons. He, He's got a big old hound mouth that don't carry like I like it to, but 
he's a good old dog and he trees coons, but back when I was hunting real hard, I probably would have kept him out of there'd been somebody loved to have him. But he's right. not a hard he's not a hard going dog. I ain't never mm-hmm. bred him or nothing. He just he don't bother no female. He don't bark in the yard and he comes when you call him. If you get tired of all that crap, you can call him, he'll come in, you can go home and watch TV. <laughs> Pretty good dog, ain't it? <laughs> yeah, that, absolutely. When you get to be our age, but, Jimmy, that's that's worth a lot right there for sure. But I, I got me a pup, that, and and that dog I was just telling you about. He's got every dog that I've ever had in his pedigree, right. and uh, I got him from Pete Barber, and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, he's uh, just like I say, he's he's a nice old dog, just plundering around with. And I got a pup that's seven and a half months old. And, uh, he's the same way. He's all the same stock and I ain't been able to hunt him. Uh, deer season here. The best thing you do is stay at the house. Yeah. I've been, I've been going a little bit, but I don't like to hunt a pup with other dogs. I like to hunt him by himself till he gets fairly accurate. Then mm-hmm. take him with other dogs. Yeah. And I, I believe I've got something that could make something, but you know, I'm tied up right now. He ain't gonna make it here for the next couple of months. And, well, uh, yeah. Well, you've got bad weather too, I imagine, don't you? Yeah. Got, but yeah. his but his age ain't hurting him, you All know. Right. But uh, he's gonna have a he's gonna be a big dog. Gonna have a big old big old mouth. If he got any brains, it'll help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Jimmy, what I'm thinking about here is we've been at this for about an hour and 10 minutes or so. Yeah. And, uh, man, I tell you what, that uh, we could go another hour, I'm sure. But, um, you know, looking back over the years uh, that you've been coon hunting, was there any special uh, hunts or special uh, a special thing that one of these dogs did or impressed you or, or a funny thing that happened, a story that, that you kind of, kind of carried down through the years with you? Well, the, uh, as far as the dogs and all, they've all done good and bad, you know, but a special hunts was a Southeastern hunt there in, uh, Salisbury, uh, used to be Clint Miller was the president of the Southeastern. And Hamp West, I believe, was the treasurer. Well, they live right there at Mount Pleasant, right out of Salisbury, and Hamp had a cabin there. Well, a bunch of us would go every year before a Salisbury hunt. We'd come there, and sometimes it'd be 10 or 12 of us. We had a plenty of room there. We'd all bring food and sweets and everything, and, and we'd stay at Hamp's cabin, and we'd hunt at night and get up and go up there at the fairground daytime, walk around, talk, and shoot the breeze, and go back and have a big old supper and hunt at night. And, and we did that for years. Mm. And then uh, his son got married and moved in our cabin. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all the all the ground they had to hunt was cut over and posted. You know, there's no hunting right there. And, and they got a, uh, a trespass law now. You don't have to have it posted. All land is automatically, tre- is automatically posted. It don't have to be marked or anything. If you go on that land, you got to have written permission within 12 months of that date in your pocket mm. and uh and most of these counties don't have a right to retrieve you can't go get your dog or you're trespassing right so all that land where we hunted down there most of it's already clear cut so that was gone and but all us boys we all us big friends we always went down there and, and hunted and, and that just made that hunt special we looked to it, forward to it every year we come in from hunting and everybody didn't go to bed we'd sit around at three or four or five in the morning just sit around shooting the breeze and cutting up and talking about stuff, you know. And uh, well, we that, didn't have to tree yeah. a bunch of coons. We just fellowship yeah. what it was. Well, uh, you know, you would enjoy very much our group out at the White River because yeah. that's exactly what we do. You know, we go out there and, and we go out and we hunt till we get ready to come in. And it might be. 12 o'clock, it might be 10 o'clock, or it might be 2, you know, just right. whatever feels right. And then when we come in, you know, get a little something to eat and sit around and the stories, you know, everybody recapping the hunt from the, the, the that night and, you know, what the dogs did this and that and that coon went this and that one did that and just, you know, just the fellowship, man. I mean. That's what it's all about. Yeah, and when you talked about that, that just sounded like so much fun, uh, you know. And, and uh, 
I always enjoyed that southeastern Trim Walker hunt at Salisbury. You yeah. know, that was a classic right there. Uh, I think the first time I went to the southeastern, it was at Lexington, wasn't it? It was uh – I believe it was at Lexington one time. It, yeah. it was at Fayette, it was at Fayetteville several years, and then it got moved to Salt. Once it moved to Salisbury, it was there until it moved to Union. Yeah, I think maybe the first year that I went, it might have been at Lexington, but I could have been thinking about that U.S. Championship hunt too. Well, now the U.S. Championship was held at Salisbury too. Oh, okay. Well, maybe. I attended that before I went to UKC. I remember yeah. that going down. Well, national line. night hunters, actual national night hunters that had the U.S. championship were the ones that started the Grand American. Uh, oh. But they were based in Ohio. You know, Joe House and J.C. Ellis, all them boys was in the national night hunters. And they mm -hmm. actually are the ones that sponsored, the, started off the Grand American. And then uh, they it went to Ohio and it got the numbers was down pretty low. So they You mean the U.S. Here. championship? U.S. Championship, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but they moved it down to Salisbury. I think they did good a couple of years. I don't know mm -hmm. why they moved it mm -hmm. away, but. Yeah. Well, it, it was always impressive to go in that. Uh, we'd laugh about wading through the water to get in the building there, <laughs> you know, at Salisbury yeah. and get in there and those old salamander heaters that always give me a busting headache, you know. But you couldn't, couldn't but, hear nothing. <laughs> no. But, man, that place would be packed, jam-packed with coon hunters, you know, and uh, then the next day walking around through the dog barns and yeah. – and all it was a great time, great, great time. And then, of course, you know, progress got a hold of that oh, yeah. deal, and and I guess they lost their parking and whatnot. And and that union is a is a good place for a hunt. Oh, I yeah. mean, yeah, they got plenty of room there, and they and got all best that. grounds around. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, time marches on for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jimmy, I have really enjoyed talking with you today. I really appreciate you taking the time we had. To, we always seem to have a – I, I am uh, always having some kind of little issue with the the uh, electronics, but I guess yeah. that just goes with uh, with the territory when you, you're my age. But, but uh, I, I've wanted to get you on the podcast for a long time, and, and you certainly didn't disappoint me, and I appreciate it. And I knew you wouldn't. Uh, yeah, I just get to talk to friends on this thing, and that's what my, that's why I do it. And uh, it's been good. Well, I, pre I appreciate you calling me. Yeah, brother, and I understand that your wife is going to have a procedure tomorrow, and, and she'll yeah. be in our prayers uh, for sure, uh, Ella and I, and— uh, we're going to stay in touch, and hopefully uh, maybe I can slip off down when the weather gets a little warmer. And when I head up to see my mother, maybe we can we can take a walk down the creek there somewhere. We'll give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Wildman Meets. Oh, I never asked you, and I was that was one of the things top on my list. How did you get the name Wildman? Well, I started going down there, like I told you, I hunted down there in them swamps from in the 60s. In fact, Jimmy Carpenter took me down there the first time, and Brack Ham's the one that owned Blaze that sold him to Leo. I went down with them. We had a place down there. We went to, we went to week after Thanksgiving, and we stayed a whole week. And I would go down there with them guys, and, and you know, them guys was out there just saying, oh, my God, what are we going to do? I said, shoot, I'll go get them. I just go get them, you know, I'd it'd be chest deep or whatever. I didn't care. I'd just go get the dogs. <laughs> and they said, he he acts like a wild man or something. He don't act <laughs> like he got no sense. And they just started saying that. And I guess it just picked up. Uh, well, it stuck with you for years, and people recognize you as that. And uh, those columns, uh, I, they're, they're treasures, really, uh, anybody that kept the old issues of Full Cry. When did you stop writing for Full Cry, Jimmy? I don't remember. Uh, I think at one time I wrote for that and the Cooner at the same Cooner, time. Yeah, and, right. and Full Cry turned into more of a squirrel hunt than a cur dog thing. Right. But, you know, when I when I first, even when I first started advertising, Tom's the first dog I ever advertised, and I advertised in the Cooner and Full Cry. 
Right. And, uh, and you know, at that time they were about the same in circulation, yeah. you know, uh, and full cry, you know, it'd be, it'd be 200 pages, 220 pages, sure. you know, and the cooler was big like that too. Of course, them mm-hmm. days is gone. That's another thing with progress. Uh, but I just, I started advertising them two things and I just started writing. I don't know why I started, but, and I don't remember when I quit, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, I can shed just a little bit of support what you or, or give you some support on what you're saying there about those magazines. When I went to UKC in 1983, you know, we wanted to start building Coonhound Bloodlines, and we only had about 3,000 subscribers. Right. Uh, and then they were most, you know, and there wasn't much to the magazine. It was a little thin thing, had a few rules in it, UKC policies and such, and it just wasn't much. But I do remember looking at the subscriptions, you know, in November of each year, the magazines required to post their uh, circulation, you know, right. in the magazine, because that's how they keep their fourth class mailing permit and all. And Cooner and Fulcra each were right at 30,000 subscribers yep. at yep. that time. And Coonhound Bloodlines was three. But we built it. You know, we got Coonhound Bloodlines up well above 20,000 uh, while I was there and closing in on that 30. But, you know, then it it kind of, you know, things just went, went south from there yeah. due to, to the Internet, no doubt. You know, well, people, I'm not. I'm not trying to pat you on the back, but you made a lot of money for a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure they all remember it. I'm sure all of us coon hunters do too. But like I, like I know, I don't even remember the year I met you, but I, I know your daddy and I thought the world of him. And then when I met you, you were just like him, but it's just like, you know, just like yeah. going on with the family. Well, I appreciate so, that. And, you know, uh, Dad, a guy gave me a real compliment the other day. He he said, I listened to your podcast, and he said, I didn't I couldn't, uh, I didn't realize that your voice had changed so much. You sound just like your dad. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a compliment for sure. Yeah, that's Cause definitely I, I definitely would love to hear that voice again. But, yeah. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much, buddy, and uh, and we'll definitely be in touch, and we'll do this again. We, I know you got a lot of stories to tell. <laughs> okay. Well, just call me anytime, bud. I appreciate uh, it. I will do that, Jim. And uh, got a little closing here that I used to, uh, usually use uh, as hey. we bring one of these uh, podcasts to a close. And and if you, uh, I kind of let the cat out of the bag, but we've been talking about them quite a bit here. Uh, the voices at the beginning of my podcast, when the uh, truck pulls up and the, and the window goes down and someone says, where's Fielder? And the answer <laughs> comes back, he's gone to the dogs. Do you know who those guys are? Uh-uh. Rob and Frank Giddings. Well, I'll return. <laughs> For Rob is the where's Fielder and Frank is he's gone to the dogs. So, yeah. So, folks, that's a wrap for another podcast. Thanks to Jimmy Meeks for being on with us tonight. And as usual, if they ask you where's Steve Fielder, just tell them he's gone to the dogs. (laughs) Okay, we'll see you, buddy. Bye now.